Thank you. Um, I just want to say that was an amazing talk, and uh, my slides are going to seem a lot more 2D. Uh, I'm, I'm from the world of clinical medicine, where we don't have um, Star Wars-like graphics, and, um, but, uh, but it was amazing to see that network view. I think my talk will be very complimentary and uh, hopefully uh, thought-provoking as well to an audience of folks who I assume are mainly basic scientists. Um, I, I have no disclosures, and I'm very grateful to the VA and other um, organizations for the support I have to do my research work. I'm a clinician, um, and I trained first in oncology and then in geriatrics. Um, so, and I'm also an epidemiologist, so I, I'm into the big picture view. So I'll be sharing that with you in the time that we have. Um, and everything I do is really motivated by my patients. And for me, uh, interacting with people who've been on the planet for 70, 80, and 90 years has been a wonderful uh, experience, both personally and also uh, professionally. Uh, it's really enriched the way I look at science, the way I think about medicine, um, and the way I think about life. And one of the things I've learned is that aging um, and age-related diseases take a lifetime to develop. They are fundamentally different from diseases uh, that young people suffer from. And I think this is something that, uh, in my experience, many people forget or leave out of their uh, scientific worldview. And so hopefully sh sharing this with you today will help enrich the way that you think about the specific area of science that you're engaged in. And I know here, very much uh, engaged in science of the brain. So this patient uh, has Alzheimer's disease. But she also has about 10 other diagnoses. And for a geriatrician, we, we uh, specialize in complexity. Uh, complexity of disease, complexity of social issues. We love complexity. And from that complexity and chaos, we try to come up with a care plan that serves the needs of the patient and simplifies and hopefully improves function. So we're very familiar with the ravages of time and the ravages of, uh, of age and environment on, uh, on patients. And uh, we see everything from uh, the long view. How did I get interested in the connection between cancer and Alzheimer's disease or neurodegeneration? When I was a fellow, an oncology fellow, uh, a couple of things happened. I met a uh, scientist called Ping Lu, who works with the protein PIN1, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a protein that actually changes the shape of other proteins, and, uh, and that's a, a molecular signal. And uh, one of the things he discovered is that if you have too much of this protein, it kind of drives cancer. And if you have too little, you get Alzheimer's disease. So I was fascinated by that because I knew that for some strange reason, in epidemiologic studies, Parkinson's disease seemed to be uh, decreased, the incidence is decreased in people who had had cancer previously and vice versa. So I wondered if the same was true for Alzheimer's disease. So I did some epidemiologic studies and showed that in fact it's true um, that, and not just me, but many other people now have shown that uh, for some strange reason uh, there seems to be this inverse comorbidity between cancer and a number of neurological diseases including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, so very unusual. Um, in geriatrics, we're, we're very familiar with comorbidity. One disease, you know, they tend to travel in packs, especially chronic diseases of aging. They're very related, as we heard in, in, the, previous, um, in the previous talk. But to have an inverse correlation is very unusual, and so it piqued my interest. So over the past 10 or 15 years now, I've been studying the connections between cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. And what I've come away with is two axes of interaction. The first, if we could look at the uh, vertical axis, you have similar pathophysiological drivers that have a different effect on different tissues. So in the case of uh, dividing cells, you get proliferation. In the case of neuron, you get cell death. Um, and then there's the horizontal axis where you have the same genes or pathways, but they're used in very different ways in the two cell types. And dysregulation 
of them creates in, in, in one direction cancer and in the other direction neurodegeneration. Um, so very interesting and complex story. What I'd like to share with you today is the thing I'm most excited about um, from all of this work, which is this, the, um, the, vertical, uh, the vertical connection here, where you have all of these very familiar pathophysiologic um, uh, uh, elements, metabolic deregulation, oxidative stress, DNA damage, mitogenic signals, inflammation, angiogenesis, aberrant cell cycle entry, these are common to both diseases. And um, what I'd like to make the point is that these are also what happens with aging. And so I'm today going to be talking about sporadic Alzheimer's or age-associated Alzheimer's, age-associated cancers, which again, I hope, hopefully I will convince you are quite different diseases from early onset forms. And I'm going to get a little philosophical on you, uh, being a big picture person. Uh, this is from a wonderful essay, uh, or it was actually a, a speech by Freeman Dyson, who is a physicist, I believe, or a mathematician. And he was um, uh, talking about the difference between birds and frogs. And you may have heard of this analogy for scientists. Um, Rene Descartes and Sir Francis Bacon at the beginning of the 17th century both proclaimed the birth of modern science. And one was a bird, Rene Descartes, and the other was a frog, uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Rene said, stay home and use logic and pure thought and deduce the laws of nature. Sir Francis Bacon said, get out there and investigate. Um, you know, go to the Galapagos, study the beaks of birds, and you will figure out um, how nature works. And uh, so we can think of Albert Einstein as a bird. He really was an eagle who, fly, who flew so high that he saw farther than all of his colleagues in the world of physics. And we can think of Marie Curie um, doing hundreds and hundreds of experiments um, with um, radioactive isotopes to, to kind of um, destroy the dogma that, that atoms couldn't be split, that there was nothing uh, smaller than an atom. A good example of a frog. And many of us here in this room are frogs, and many may be birds. Um, but the, the point of this lecture and the point, I think, of his speech was both together are needed for science to go forward. Um, why did I end up studying Alzheimer's disease, being trained as an oncologist? One of the reasons is because um, since I finished my fellowship, there have been over 200 drugs approved uh, for ca cancers, different sorts. And we don't yet have even one that is a disease-modifying drug for Alzheimer's disease. And um, as a big picture person looking at the history of Alzheimer's disease. When I was a fellow also, there was an article that came out um, about 100 years, the 100 year anniversary of the first description of Alzheimer's disease. And when I read it, I started to see the problem in the field and wanted to try to do something to change it. So here in 1906, we see the, the plaques and tangles first um, seen under the microscope. And, uh, uh, and we know now that this was a case of early onset Alzheimer's disease, not the typical sporadic Alzheimer's disease that 95% of people actually get. Um, you, you can see here that in the 1980s, beta amyloid was first sequenced. In the 1990s, we had sequencing of beta amyloid gene, discovery of tau, um, and, and sequencing of that gene. And then finally, uh, development of antibodies to target beta amyloid. Again, with this whole, the whole hypothesis being if we could just target this, this uh, toxic protein, get rid of it, we could cure the disease. And now in 2017, after the failure of multiple different anti-amyloid antib antibodies and other drugs uh, to influence am amyloid, um, to modulate amyloid, we now have the final study, I think it will be, um, the A4 trial, where we're giving these antibodies to people with normal cognition, but who have plaques in their brains. And we're a site actually, um, Rhesus Burling from Mass General, I think is the, the lead investigator for this study. 
giving antibodies to people without disease to try to prevent the disease. Um, and what I'd like to what I'd like to say is that the problem with this approach, and it's been it's a very common approach over the past 50 years, in, is that it uses a paradigm that forgets some very important things about life. Uh, D.C. Wallace calls it the anatomic paradigm. That the idea that evolution um, is by natural selection, acting on different forms, so the shape of your beak, for example. That DNA is nuclear and inheritance is Mendelian. And that organ-specific symptoms are the result of organ-specific defects, okay, um, rather than systematic or widespread types of processes. And that has led to the development of organ-based specialties. So if you have a brain problem, you see a neurologist. If you want to do research in uh, Alzheimer's disease, you better be a neurologist because at NINDS, all the people on the study section are neurologists, and chances are they also have the same paradigm of understanding of disease as you. And the problem with this is that we end up working within a paradigm that is incomplete. Um, this is James Watson looking at the structure of DNA. And it's interesting, in, his, in the 90s, James Watson, who's quite a character, as some of you may know, um, started philosophizing a little bit about discovering the double helix. And he even joked that it was the worst thing he ever did for science, which seems like a strange thing to say, um, as we are all so genetic-centric uh, these days, hard for us to grasp. What he meant was that once DNA was discovered, people dropped biochemistry like a hot potato. And he felt that for the war on cancer, what was necessary was to, um, you know, what he basically said in this article, I think it was in Science, we need a new generation of smart biochemists to help us make progress. You know, we've made an incredible amount of progress from the genetic point of view. Now we need to turn to uh, biochemistry and particularly to bioenergetics. So I want to share with you a bird's eye view of uh, the field um, that inf is informed by both my knowledge of cancer and also of neurodegeneration. Um, and take the more Cartesian approach rather than the Baconian approach, um, hopefully to expand all of our horizons and, uh, and help us to realize that it is important that birds and frogs work together. So um, I am not an eagle by any means. I am a bird. I would consider myself more of a sandpiper. Uh, if you know, I don't know if you have sandpipers here in Seattle, but back in Boston, they are the birds that you know spend a lot of time on the ground. They even go in the water, and they do fly as well. So, but uh, the eagle that walked into my life was Dr. Lloyd Demetrius, who is a uh, mathematician and evolutionary biologist. He came to my office one day and said, um, I can explain to you the origin of Alzheimer's disease. And he wrote these formulas on the wall, on, on my board. And, um, and he convinced me that it was true. And I, I said, but yes, but to convince people, you have to show um, that it's true. And I don't know if anyone here has seen the movie, The Man Who Knew Infinity. Has anyone seen that, that film? It's really worthwhile um, about the great uh, mathematician Ramanujan, uh, who's Indian and um, who knew all of these things by intuition and then had to learn how to prove them, which for him was very painful. So, so a bird um, doesn't want to be bothered with the details of proving what he or she knows is true. Um, and, uh, and so the past five years, I would say, I've spent trying to see if his theory was correct. His theory is really based on um, uh, many truths from uh, evolutionary biology and physics. So we'll do a little bit of a, a review here. So what do we need to survive on the planet? We need to do three things. The first one we're very well aware of, and we focus on this a huge amount in science. Maintain integrity of genetic material and pass it on with fidelity. So the flow of information from cell to cell, 
from organism to organism. But we forget about the other two. The second, meet energy needs, right? The cell has to do work, if, even if it wants to make DNA or, or use it to make a protein. And then the third, maintain somatic systems in the face of entropy and other forces. So just think about chaperone proteins, you know, proteins that help, help refold the misfolded proteins. There's this constant, constant output of energy to help fight the second law of thermodynamics, or entropy, which, again, many, many people forget, is at work our whole lives um, and ends up um, contributing to our aging. And so different species and different cell types meet these challenges very differently. Um, so if you're an elephant and you're not too worried about predators, it becomes uh, possible to really stretch out your lifespan. Elephants can live to about 70 years. But if you're a mouse and you're small and you're very vulnerable, it makes sense for you not to live too long and to have many offspring at once, hoping that at least one of them will survive and you can pass your genes on to the next generation. So we have a short-lived um, uh, version and a long-lived version, um, each one making trade-offs of different sorts in order to fill their niche in, um, you know, in the evolutionary sense. Well, what about cells? How, if I'm going to live to 90 years, how am I going to do it? So there are two main strategies. One is to divide, to live a short time like the mouse, and then reproduce. Um, so cycling cells survive by replacement. And um, they cooperate with one another. They tend to all have the same job description. They're replaceable. And uh, interestingly, uh, the origin of multicellularity probably came about because it's more efficient to do oxidative phosphorylation. And that works the best when everyone shares, right? When you have a whole bunch of tissue that is using that scarce resource very efficiently, and when you have job division of labor, OK? So here we have cells that really are very focused on making sure their DNA is correct when they pass it on, because that's key, right, to the longevity. Um, they can meet their own energy needs, and they can switch between oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis when needed. Um, and what's important for them is to die on time, right? And the major trade-off of this, as we know, is the risk of cancer, the risk that instead of being cooperative, one of the cells will become very uncooperative and put the rest at risk. Neurons, totally different strategy. The neuron, once it's made its connections, hopefully lives as long as you do, so you can keep your memories intact. They're irreplaceable. They're networked. They have no, vi uh, no business trying to divide. But what would the point of that be? And so the only possible outcome when a neuron tries to divide is uh, cell death. It's important for the neuron not to die too early, right? And we know that they are the most energy intense cells. They use the most energy of just about any cell in the body especially those involved in um, the storage uh, in the hippocampus and, and the, the forming and storage of memory. Um, they are incredibly dependent cells, unlike the cycling cells, which are very independent, although they work together. Um, they're very self-sufficient. The neuron has outsourced a lot of its basic functions to the cells around it, to glial cells, for example. Um, it's dependent on them for help with nutrition and taking away its trash which actually are the two big priorities. The neuron doesn't care so much about keeping its DNA in perfect shape, right? It only fixes the parts that it needs, that it uses. But what it's really worried about is energy and um, cellular maintenance and waste removal. So the trade-off here is that it's very vulnerable to the risk of death from energy exhaustion and from buildup of waste. And uh, Bernie Crespi, sent me this article, which I thought was wonderful. Um, and he's, he talked about some of these trade-offs that different cell types have made and how it can cause a pattern of diametric disease, um, which I think we have in the case of cancer and neurodegeneration. It's kind of the 
logical outflow of the biological laws and the physical constraints that come with um, having a, a certain role in the body and, um, and fulfilling that role. One of the most important points I'd like to make in the talk is that there's a fundamental difference between early onset forms of disease and late onset forms. Um, early onset forms are primarily genetic, and many of you may do research with these early onset severe um, diseases. They can be attributed to one gene or a few genes. They present early in life, they're severe, and they're strongly selected against, so they tend to be rare. And in, the, in these diseases, we can think of age as just chronological. It's just a matter of time before this disease expresses itself and in many cases ends the life of the person even before their reproductive years. So that's a classic severe genetic disease that has Mendelian, many times Mendelian inheritance. Then we have late diseases, disease, chronic diseases of aging. They are primarily metabolic. They are not primarily genetic diseases. And one of the reasons that we don't find much on GWAS and, uh, is because it's really not about genes in many cases. Um, or let's say a chunk of it is not. We're talking more about pro uh, processes like entropy, random mutation, uh, metabolic dysregulation. So many genes make small contributions. And these diseases present after reproductive maturity. They're chronic and slowly progressive. And age, we have to think of in terms of biological time, not just chronological time. OK, so I'd like to explain that a little more. But first, let's think about genes and aging. We know that, that uh, natural selection is really focused on getting you to, uh, if we could say it this way, getting you to reproductive age. Um, and having you reproduce. And what happens after that isn't so relevant, right? There isn't much of a selective pressure to maintain ourselves in the long term. And there's, it's a really nice work showing this uh, recently. Um, this paper just came out. Uh, that if you look at risk alleles from SNPs associated with late onset disease, um, they are much more common than those associated with early onset disease, right, which goes with this whole idea of accumulation of mutations. Um, but what's so interesting is that genes related to aging or senescence tend to have the opposite effect, good effects, for early onset diseases. So in other words, something that protects you from an early onset disease but tends to make your golden years, not so golden, right, T tends to um, uh, make your aging um, worse, are going to be selected for. And so many, many times you'll find, for example, they gave, give an example of a gene that protects you from glioma, a tumor that young people can get, and it actually increases your risk of about five chronic diseases of aging. So like that, there are many, many examples. That's called antagonistic pleiotropy in uh, in evolutionary speak. And this is a nice uh, uh, illustration of this. So here are the genes related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, on the top, you see the three, three genes that uh, cause familial Alzheimer's disease, which uh, presents decades and decades earlier than um, the typical sporadic form. We can say that these, there's a causal relationship, at least hopefully, um, I hope that these anti-amyloid antibodies will be effective in helping to slow the onset of disease in people with this form of, on, of Alzheimer's. Um, and, but it's very rare. It's, it's a very small percentage of the total. If you look at the information from GWAS studies for late onset disease, you see this wide variety of genes that do all kinds of different things, um, not so much related to beta amyloid. Um, but related to many other things. And um, interestingly, uh, many of them actually confer survival advantage for things earlier in life. Um, but unfortunately, later in life, they may contribute to uh, development of dementia. So what do, I, what do I mean by biological time? 
What does that mean? Five minutes? Okay, great. All right, that's always good. Okay. Biological time. Biological time, yeah. Chronological is what's killing me at the moment. Uh, okay. So, um, so biological time. Uh, these are all the things that are happening over these decades and decades that we live after our reproductive, you know, years are over. And um, the, this forms the, the kind of common ground on which diseases of aging occur, okay? So inflammation, genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetics, loss of proteostasis, deregulated nutrient sensing or metabolic deregulation, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion. So these, this is what biological time means. This is what is a huge component of age-related diseases. And we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about them, when we're studying them. Um, and this is something that is modifiable. OK. A lot of people freaked out by uh, uh, Thomas Eddy and Vogelstein's work showing that um, this huge percentage of mutations in different types of cancer um, are accounted for by random mutation. And there was a huge outcry. The American Cancer Society got all upset. Are you saying we can't prevent cancer? No, that's not what they're saying. Um, what they're saying, though, is that um, a huge, uh, uh, a very significant portion of the mutations involved happen randomly. And somehow people can't get their mind around this. But it makes a lot of sense if you've been on the planet for a really long time. And every time your stem cell divides, you have an average of three mutations. Um, then uh, it makes sense that a lot of the mutations will be acquired, sporadic. Um, in DNA, uh, you have mutations that um, uh, probably are driving a lot of the aging process. And again, people forget that there's DNA in, uh, in mitochondria. So in the last five minutes, I want to talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing. And uh, just to give you a, a, you know, a refresher, we have two major ways of um, making ATP, which we need to do work in the cell. One is glycolysis, very simple but inefficient. But at the same time, it produces biomass. If we want to build things, if we want to make nucleic acids, it also helps uh, produce antioxidants. Um, uh, and so, uh, and then we have oxidative phosphorylation, uh, which uh, produces many more ATP, very efficient, but much more complex, and many things can go wrong um, in the mitochondrion. So the, um, so the idea is that when resources are scarce, Oxidative phosphorylation has a selective advantage. When resources are abundant, glycolysis has the selective advantage. And efficient resource use requires cooperation between organisms or cells. Um, and uh, the problem there is that cooperative cells put themselves at risk to non-cooperative cells. And the the interesting thought I'd like to leave with you is that ca both cancer and Alzheimer's disease, um, I believe, are primarily metabolic diseases, especially the only the late onset forms. And they start because of uncooperative cells. Uh, in cancer, I may, may, maybe you're familiar with the Warburg effect. Um, most people outside of the field don't know much about it. But that, that uh, was first described by Professor Warburg back around the time that World War II broke out. And he noticed that cancer cells would switch to glycolysis. And in doing so, they were able then to build all that biomass they needed. But also, um, they were able to outcompete their normal neighbors for glucose. And so a part of the toxicity of the cancer cell in the environment was the fact that it was gobbling up all the food. And he hypothesized that um, it would be a great way to target cancer and to treat cancer to try to mess up that metabolic machinery, that metabolic reprogramming. Okay. And here's a PET scan. As you, as you may know, we use this clinically. And cancer tends to light up brightly on the PET scans. 
because um, it's such a metabolically overactive tissue. So the theory that uh, myself and Dr. Demetrius and others have put forward is that Alzheimer's disease is primarily a disease of bioenergetic failure. Its incidence increases exponentially with age, which is what you would predict. Um, some of the genes associated with it, actually uh, including APOE4, confer a survival advantage earlier in life. Age-related metabolic decline will lead some neurons to upregulate their metabolism in compensation. And then that sets up natural selection and competition. Neurons with upregulated metabolism outcompete the normal ones. The normal ones have to upregulate their own metabolism. And, um, and so this model would predict that the treatment or the prevention for this is um, interventions and behaviors that foster overall metabolic health. And um, so here's the model. Basically, your mitochondrion has age-related decline, let's say. Um, you upregulate in the same way that a cancer cell upregulates. In the case of a neuron, it's upregulating oxfos, not switching to glycolysis. That actually leads to more oxidative damage and stress in the neuron that's upregulated, and it causes the networked neurons to have to do the same, um, to upregulate, and uh, eventually leading to neuronal loss. So there's actually a huge amount of evidence to support this theory, which began with a bunch of, um, uh, of uh, mathematical formulas on my whiteboard. Um, where does Alzheimer's disease begin, or Parkinson's disease? In the neurons that use the most energy. How does it spread along networks with other neurons that use the most energy of all neurons in the brain? Here we have um, uh, an MRI showing um, that people who end up declining in their memory have upregulated their metabolism in the hippocampal um, area. Here we have an example of uh, the fact that APOE4 carriers, okay, so that's the strongest uh, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, they actually are upregulators of metabolism. Of, uh, and so instead of the metabolism normally declines a little bit with age, in APOE4 carriers it doesn't. And that may confer a selective advantage earlier on, but what it does is burn out those cells and makes them more vulnerable to energy exhaustion. And this may be the reason why APOE4 is a risk factor. My final slide is showing you that we already have an intervention that can slow the progress of um, Alzheimer's disease that is effective. And that is um, nutritional interventions um, an exercise, the finger study is a very famous one that combined, it was a multimodal intervention for metabolic health that makes a difference. And in fact, if the A4 trial actually is positive, it, then the, the curves would look similar to this. But this is free, and this is um, available to everyone. And it's proof of principle that Alzheimer's disease is a metabolic disease. Not just Alzheimer's, but most diseases of aging, including uh, cancer, uh, and this is the way we have to think of them. So what are we working on now? A number of things. We're looking at metformin, uh, an anti-diabetic medication uh, that by different mechanisms um, improves metabolic health. Uh, we are hopefully going to try to test this hypothesis of the propagation and natural selection um, involving, um, involving bioenergetics. and. Um, thinking about um, clin in, in the clinic using uh, both multimodal exercise and nutritional interventions and some of these nutraceuticals and other um, repurposing drugs to improve metabolic health in younger age uh, to prevent both cancer and neurodegeneration um, in the future. So thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge all my, uh, all my uh, co-investigators. Thank you. We have time for a few questions.
So you, you did the, the, the formulas you put on the, uh, on the board, of course, they are all entropic processes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, at what level, where exactly did you use those entropic principles to, uh, in, the, in the case of Alzheimer? Sure. So um, the, um, the, the general principle is that in the case of Alzheimer's disease, you have, um, you have a steady supply of fuel, so let's say glucose, but with aging, the amount is decreased. And so in, in that situation, um, you, so the, the, at least the, at the far side, the, um, the equations we're describing something called um, evolutionary entropy. So usually, you know, the second law of th thermodynamics is entropy among uh, in inanimate system. Evolutionary entropy is a concept that Dr. Demetrius came up with, with ba which basically says um, it's a measure of kind of the, um, the different pathways of energy flow in a system. And so the mitochondrion obviously has more evolutionary entropy. It's more complex compared to glycolysis. And uh, what ends up happening in the neuron is that its glycolysis supply, which comes from um, astrocytes, is decreased. And so you get a decrease in evolutionary entropy. And its, its compensation is to upregulate, for the neuron to upregulate its own oxidative phosphorylation. And so that's the, what the equations predict is what will happen um, in compensation. So, um, so then you end up with natural selection where you have, um, you have neurons that are upregulating their um, oxidative phosphorylation. The neurons around them have to do the same if they want to keep up with their um, energy requirements. And then you get propagation of, of the problem. So, um, I can definitely send you the article that explains the whole thing. Being a physicist, you would understand it much better than, than I do. But um, the, the equations are, are describing a phenomenon known as evolutionary entropy. And uh, that's, I think, his contribution to uh, this field, uh, which helps predict, essentially, um, why, if you have a cell that's struggling uh, from the point of view of bioenergetics, how that, how it would compensate and then how it would affect the cells around it. Yes. Great talk. Um, was the, the study you showed with the uh, metabolic support, was that a retrospective study or a, a clinical trial? It was a clinical trial. It was a two, it's called the FINGER trial, the Finnish intervention, blah, 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 blah. Can't remember the rest of it. Um, Finnish geriatric intervention or something like that. Um, it was a two-year trial, and they basically um, uh, had a very intensive program of um, diet and exercise, and um, the control group, I can't remember, they had something, it wasn't like nothing versus, but, um, but these multimodal interventions seem to be what's effective. People have tried just exercise, they've tried just nutrition, they've tried just nutraceuticals. It's when you put them together that they seem to be effective. So yeah, two years, um, people were in the intervention group. They exercised you know, weekly, they, or a few times a week. They had special diet, basically Mediterranean diet. And um, the results I showed you were their cognitive function. So people in the intervention group did signi significantly better than um, the, you know, it was a randomized controlled trial. So uh, very impressive results. Yeah. Um, so for people that sustain traumatic brain injury, clinicians are beginning to use these ketogenic diets, which yes. are going to be low carb, low glucose, and they're seeing some benefits to that. And by the looks of it, this might be beneficial for cancer as well. So is this going to be a kind of a cure-all diet that we might be able to fight cancer as well as brain degeneration? Right. Very but generally speaking, of course. That's the idea. So there's a, a new field called geroscience, which is from my neck of the woods in geriatrics and aging research. And the hypothesis is that 
um, it's pretty much all about metabolism and uh, exercise and calories, um, because there's already an intervention we know of that can double the lifespan of a mouse. Does anybody know what it is? Caloric, Caloric restriction, okay, right. And there's growing evidence that fasting every other day is actually a treatment for cancer. Um, we have growing evidence of the importance of exercise, um, both mental exercise, physical exercise. I mean, these are things that geriatricians use to improve function in people who are already a mess from the ravages of aging. Um, so the idea is that if you can slow aging, if you can slow these processes, everything from you know, D DNA uh, damage to, um, to metabolic health to whatever, all those things on the wheel I showed you, then you actually will be preventing everything um, at the same time. Now, we're, you know, people had this hope that you know, sirtuins were going to be like, you could just take this resveratrol and it would happen without the exercise and without the behavior change. And I mean, that hasn't panned out, but there are, there, I think it's just a matter of time before we um, start repurposing drugs like metformin, which works in multiple pathways, the mTOR pathway, for those of you familiar with that. Um, also, it's a, it's a little bit of a mitochondrial poison, so it seems to actually um, uh, improve mitochondrial health. People think that exercise does that as well, that it's a little bit of a stress, and then the body will respond to the stress in an adaptive and healthy way. Um, so that's exactly it, that what I get excited about in terms of the nexus of cancer and Alzheimer's is um, that actually there's so much common not so much genetically speaking, but in terms of the aging component, that by doing interventions that slow aging, you actually will slow uh, or decrease the incidence of both diseases. We have time for one more question. One more. Way back, yeah. Way back. So if you look at one of the, probably the poster child for an aging cancer to be prostate cancer. And, but that's actually a fat, fatty acid synthase is markedly upregulated in that disease and glycolysis not so much. Um, so that would be more consistent with the neurodegenerative, neurodegeneration that you're looking at. Uh, what is the association of AD and, and uh, prostate cancer, or is there any? Since they're both sort of fatty metabolic diseases, according to your theories. Right, that's a great question. So did everyone hear that question? Um, it turns out, at least in, I just did a study in the VA data set, which is over, you know, in, included over three and a half million uh, veterans, mostly men, so they had a lot of prostate cancer. And in fact, with prostate cancer, there's a positive association with uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is very different from what you see in most other cancers. It's the same with, it's true also with breast cancer, and not in my cohort, but in other cohorts. So these type of metabolic cancers are actually showing an, an increased risk, whereas other cancers that aren't so metabolically, you know, so closely linked to, to metabolism, like lung cancer um, uh, or leukemia or lymphoma, you see an in inverse association. So um, I think that it's not every cancer where you see uh, an inverse, but and the pattern is that um, prostate and breast, um, actually you see a positive association. So what that all means, I'm not sure. It could be something related to screening. You know, prostate and breast are screening-related cancers. You can only tell so much from, from epidemiology, but um, I think uh, it, it's not unreasonable to think that cancers that are very linked to metabolism, for example, prostate and breast are both linked to diabetes, um, that there would be a different relationship um, than other cancers that aren't so metabolically linked. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's, it's fascinating. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.